Hey, hey Jonathan, Curtis, guess what? Oh, go ahead. Oh, go oh, ahead. No. Oh, no. Okay, you first. Okay. Well, I was thinking of a good way to start the show. Okay, great. Let's hear it. Did you know that using the right equipment, you can see with your tongue? Mm. Is that what the show's about tonight? Well, yeah, but only when you take into account the way the physical world and everything we learn about it mirrors and teaches us something about the deeper spiritual plane of reality. How are you going to start the show? With a game. Do you want to play? Okay. Well, let's race to where I'm already standing. First one there wins. Ready? Wait, Go! No, I, I win! That game is done. <laughs> Exactly. To set up a scenario, but then give some of the participants impossible odds really makes you question the intelligence, not to mention the heart of whoever it was who set that game up. Yeah, totally. But if God, who is divine intelligence itself, sets up life, why does it seem like the deck is so stacked against some people? And here we get to the heart of it. If God exists and loves everyone totally and wants to give everyone the chance to develop and live an eternally happy life, are we really all being given a fair chance? Yeah, and do you think your tongue-seeing scenario can help us get to an answer? Well, we're about to find out. Stay tuned. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg and Life. We're looking tonight at Why Don't Things Seem Fair? This is Curtis Childs, and he'll be your host. I'm Jonathan Rose. So, man, <laughs> what are you doing? All right, this might look silly, but I'm actually rewiring my own brain right now. It's called sensory substitution, just FYI. Mm. Okay, it looks cool. I guess I'm wondering how exactly you're rewiring your brain with that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm not totally sure. I, I was reading an article about it, and I got so excited by how the technology looked mm -hmm. that I just grabbed some stuff that sort of looked like the stuff in the article. Oh, I see. Okay. But I do suspect that we might have on our hands here a really cool correspondence. For those of you who haven't heard the term of Swedenborg's correspondence before, it means an external thing in this world that embodies and teaches us about something spiritual. So what one do you think is operative here? Well, it's complicated, but I think that it might shed some light on the burning question, why does life seem so unfair? Mm, right. If God exists and wants everyone to grow and develop and be happy right. and eventually get to heaven, why does it seem like some people get a life that makes it much more difficult to do those things. Exactly. Some people are born rich with access to education and opportunities to grow, while others are born with almost no options. Some people are born into violent, dangerous situations where you almost have to commit crimes to get by. Doesn't that make it so much harder to get to heaven? Yeah. And with, with other things, too, some people have a really rough childhood. Like mm. They seem to miss out on that sort of essential childhood innocence. And with romantic luck, some people seem to find their soulmate when they're 21, but for other people, things you know, go terribly. Even setting aside all the suffering involved, all these things seem like they would affect our chances to develop spiritually, and wouldn't God want to give everyone a fair chance? Yeah, exactly. And that's where this sensory substitution mm. stuff comes in. Well, not this, but the actual sensory substitution stuff. I think it could be that what modern science is learning about neuroplasticity can give us a model for how divine providence protects everyone's spiritual potential carefully. It sounds great, but don't you think you should finish reading that article first? Yeah, I'm going to read it during the break. The 10 second break that's happening right now? Yeah, here I go. Again, in this episode, we're not dealing with why suffering is allowed. For that CR show, Why Do Bad Things Happen? What we're looking at here is, are some people given in life a spiritual disadvantage or, or a slow start? Now, in the opening section, I was playing with these VR goggles on my head. Yeah, it's silly, but it's totally different than the actual device we're looking at here. That is called Brainport. And you can check it out for yourself on their website. And what it does is there's a camera mounted on the front hooked up to an electrode on the tongue. And so what the camera sees, it translates into a low resolution grayscale uh, picture of whatever's in front of you. And then that electrode shocks different parts of your tongue in a way corresponding to that. So you can actually, through your tongue, feel what the camera is seeing 
in front of you. And it is amazingly, people are able to use that to navigate lines on a track. You can even see them playing tic-tac-toe in one part of the video. And it's all because of the brain's ability to process that incoming information. And we learned about this through an article called Sight Unseen by Nicola Twilley in The New Yorker. And what that article is saying is that Brainport and devices like it are revolutionizing our understanding of the senses and of sense development, because the current mainstream theory is that there are certain periods uh, of critical development in senses. Like if you miss the the period from age something to age something when you're supposed to be developing your sight, that's it. It's too late for you to ever develop sight uh, after that. But Brainport is finding that even congenitally blind people, people who have never been able to see, are able to process this information coming through the electrode on the tongue, and they're processing it using using the visual part of their brain. So somehow, even though it's coming in the form of electricity on the tongue, the brain knows we're seeing something. Like this is, this is vision that's happening here, and the part that you'd think was dormant or atrophied in them that was supposed to process visual information is going, and it's able to put that together, and it allows them to see in a different way what's ahead of them. So what we're finding, this article seems to be pointing towards, that sensing is deeper than the organ that we usually associate with the senses. This is a quote from that article. It says, correct wiring is laid down in the brain regardless of whether it is ever used. The visual cortex seems to be linked to vision only because most of us use sight in order to gather the type of information it processes. So this is a really cool thing just for people in this world, that we're able to give people through technology another way to gather information about the world around them, but it seems to have this implication that could lead us to a, to spiritual discoveries as well, because Swedenborg actually understood the senses in this way as well, even back in his days. So he was ahead of his time there. This is Secrets of Heaven 4042. He says, only through humankind is there a descent from the heavens into the world, and an ascent from the world into the heavens. The brain and its inner depths provide the means of descent and ascent because they contain the actual rudiments or starting and ending points from which absolutely everything in the body stems and flows. They are also the source of the thoughts in our intellect and the emotions in our will. So in that quote, Swedenborg is placing importance for sensory experience on the brain. He's saying, listen, the brain is where it actually all starts. That's what we're learning currently through the article we just showed you, that this uh, sensory substitution stuff is showing that even if the stuff you typically associate with sense, you think you see because of your eye, right? Actually, the power to see is in the brain. And even if information comes through a different route, like say through your tongue, through a, a bunch of electrical signals on it, your brain visual center will be the part processing that, right? Because it's the brain is the, the essential element in the sensory experience of sight. It's not actually the organ that it comes through. And so Swedenborg recognized that back in his day, but he even took it a step farther because he's saying, yeah, the brain is important, but it's actually even the brain, the physical brain is not the starting point for this stuff. It's actually, there's a spiritual level behind that. And he talks about that in Secrets of Heaven 10199. All outward sensation traces its origin to inner sensation, which takes place in the intellect and will. So in a human, it traces its origin to faith with its truth and to love with its goodness, which make up the human intellect and will. Everything we experience through our outer sensory organs comes as an influence from within, because the direction of inflow is always from inner depths to outer surface, not the other way around. Our inner attributes, attributes proper to our intellect and will, exist in the spiritual world, and our outer attributes, attributes proper to our bodily senses, exist in the physical world. So it's, it's a little bit backwards from what you think. It's not that it's the eye that's seeing, and then the brain learns from that. Now, the brain is doing the seeing, and it reaches out to gather information from the eye. But Swedenborg is saying that even the brain is playing a role similar to the eye to the spirit meaning that what really is the processing center for information in a human being is in the will and the intellect, and those are spiritual things. So those are reaching out and using the brain to interpret information that's coming through whatever is giving it its information. So in that way, actually, the spiritual side of things is what's really creating the experiences that that we go through every day. And it's really our spiritual senses that are working through our physical senses. Yeah, that's right. Swedenborg makes a great statement about this in Divine Love and Wisdom 386. Our mind is our spirit, and the spirit is a person. Right. 
the body being a covering through which the mind or spirit senses and acts in its world. So the essential us is, is sort of back behind the frame. It's, mm, it's that's in right. the spiritual world. I, I think about Helen Keller, you know, her, her mm. not, not being able to see, but writing uh, of Swedenborg's works. She, she was, did you know she was into reading Swedenborg? Yeah, that's that, right. That they allowed her to see in the spirit. That, that mm. no matter what the condition of our physical body is, there's still this faculty of spiritual understanding, which is the, the correspondence of sight, that's there and it's untouched. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what else is, is possible? Oh, right, right. So even if our physical sight, and even if the visual part of our brain were damaged, yep. we still have the part of our spirit that deals with spiritual sight. Yes, yes. So that's there no matter what. So I'm wondering what other potentials mm. are there for us? What regions mm. in our spirit are intact no matter what we're going through, even if we don't realize it? Yeah, it's exciting to think about. Can you think of any? Do you know of some? Yeah. Do you mind if I take part two? Sure, sounds good. I'll be working on something for part three. Let's go explore some spiritual potential regions. So we talked in the previous section about how even if you were born blind and you think oh, there, there's, there's no part of the brain that is receptive to sight anymore, that would have atrophied or, or gone away by now, that as soon as there's sensory input coming in a different way, there was a region in the brain the whole time that was just ready to see however that information came in. So it's a story of even when th it seems like there's a lost note, there, there's this potential the whole time, we just need to reignite it to get it, that there's something interior that's been protected. So seeing that on the physical level, does that play out on the spiritual level as well? Meaning that all the tough things we go through in life, is there actually parts of us in there that are untouchable and that are ready to progress no matter what the external circumstances are? And the short answer and long answer is yes, that we actually have written into us three layers of heaven that are meant to be opened in sequence. And Swedenborg talks about this in Divine Love and Wisdom 231. In regard to the inner reaches of our minds, each of us is a miniature form of heaven. Count the number of heavens and you have the number of vertical levels within each of us. From our creation, each of us is an image and likeness of God. So these three levels are written into us because they are in the divine human one, that is, in the Lord. So these levels written into the fabric of who we are. Then further from Divine Love and Wisdom 236, these three vertical levels exist in each of us from birth and can be opened in sequence. As they are opened, we are in the Lord and the Lord is in us. So there's this path upwards that's written into who we are. And that seems great. That seems like the right progression to be the story of our life, that we continue to grow and develop in this like destined, preordained way that we were designed in. But what if life doesn't unfold in the way that we feel like it should? It seems like the materials to allow us to go on that path aren't provided. And we look at it, let's look at a couple of potential regions in the spirit here that are, what if you don't get the necessary components on earth? Can these still be there waiting for you in the spirit? So let's look first at the, the married love region of our spiritual brain. And because so, Swedenborg places a lot of emphasis, he says that married love can be so great, you know, in, in the next life, but it doesn't always work out that well uh, in life, right? We, we don't always, relationships don't always go well. Some people are abused when they're young and just can't seem to fight. There's all kinds of fits that don't happen. So is it just that some people develop in, in toward the, this happy relationship and other people don't? How does that work? Well, we're going to look at Swedenborg's book, Love in Marriage, also translated as Conjugal Love in other translations. This is 229. He says, for people who yearn for real married love, the Lord provides someone similar. And, and you might be saying, well, he didn't do that for me, but, and if someone similar is not available on earth, he provides someone in heaven. The reason is that the Lord provides all the marriages based on real married love. So right there, no matter what, if even if life does not seem to be providing you with that at all, and it seems irredeemable, there is this, the true relationship we can all come into can happen after death. And that married love, the potential for that is not just something that you can kind of like, well, I've got a good job, but yeah, I don't really do that. It's a, it's a fundamental part of the foundation of being human. Swedenborg describes it in Conjugal Love, which is, again, the other translation of married love. Don't get it twisted. This is 65. 
He says, regarded in its essence, conjugal love is the fundamental love of all loves in heaven and the church, because it originates from the marriage between good and truth. And from this marriage spring all the loves which form heaven and the church in a person. The good in this marriage produces love, and the truth in it produces wisdom. And when love is added to wisdom, or united with it, then love becomes loving. And when wisdom conversely is added to love and united with it, then wisdom becomes wise. Truly conjugal love is nothing but a union of love and wisdom. Two married partners who have this love between them and in them at the same time are a reflection and an image of it. So the fundamental in there is actually a thing that happens in your heart and your mind. It's the union of love and wisdom, and the relationship is is an external sort of reflection of that. So really... God is providing for everybody in this world the ability to unite those two in themselves, love and wisdom. And that's actually, you might think, oh, meeting somebody or having things go right, that's how, no, it's the uniting of love and wisdom in you. The actual pairing that can happen after that, God's got that taken care of in providence. So no matter how messed up things seem, no matter how much it seems like, oh, I could never get into a state like the one Swedenborg describes of this, like, you know, um, romantic bliss that he talks about happening in heaven, everybody can be. There's that potential region is still there and functioning no matter what we've been through on earth. Moving on from that, what about like, uh, you know, the potential to grow intellectually or or what you could call the educational spiritual brain region? Because Swedenborg talks about the importance of wisdom. You just saw it in that previous quote that that learning is the equivalent of eating in the spirit, that we hunger for ideas and they are what help us grow. But it certainly doesn't seem like everybody here gets a fair shake at developing intellectually or, or in wisdom, because some people just don't seem to be born in the right situation to start to develop. You know, there's there's debate about how much does uh, how do the programs you're in educationally at one level help you get to the next level. There's a study they looked at that seemed to indicate if you have really good programs early, that makes it easier to get to the next level. So if somebody who starts out with a really good schooling, does that make, does that start them on a track that puts them at an advantage? And if you'd start out with poor schooling, that just makes it harder and harder to succeed. Well, there's, that's a question that people are trying to figure out in the physical world. But if this is the preschool of life, you know, the physical world is where we start, but then we go on to these bigger and better things in the spiritual world. If we don't get a chance to be educated here, and to really develop intellectually and learn spiritual truths and all these important things. Do we always have a slow start? Will we always be behind? And then will we be below our grade level in the next life? No. And that's because it's not really about what you learn. It's about how you love. Even the intellectual side of things ends up being about how you love. Swedenborg told a story, he tells stories in many places of seeing people who he called simple, which probably isn't the way we describe people now, but these are people who relatively uh, uneducated, maybe not of great intelligence, but he saw them when they got into the spiritual world, they were suddenly talking uh, in an ama- with an amazing capacity for wisdom, that he was shocked at the transformation. It was because they had this love and that the love in them was receptive to the wisdom of heaven, that because they had developed their heart, all the brain stuff came along. He actually says that we can all be taught by angels in the afterlife. So we can, if we've set up a condition where we're interested in learning what's good and true, you can be brought up to speed amazingly quickly. This is True Christianity 255. He says, after we die, we are all taught by angels. If we can see truths and can see falsities in contrast to truths, we are accepted into heaven. The only people who are able to see truths, however, are those who have not reinforced false ideas in themselves. Those who have reinforced false ideas are unwilling to see truths. So only if you really grab onto it and are adamant about it. If they see truths, they turn away and either laugh at what they have been seen or falsify it. The real reason for this is that becoming adamant enters the will, and the will is the real person. The will controls the intellect as it wishes. Merely knowing something enters only the intellect, and the intellect has no jurisdiction over the will. Knowledge, therefore, is not really inside us, just as someone who is standing on a porch or in an entrance is not really inside the house. It's not even really about what you know, it's about what you want to know. If somebody's hungry for the truth in their life, they want want to know what's right and good and true, that's more important because that's the kind of spiritual foundation that can then soak in knowledge in the afterlife. You hear people having near-death experiences where they're saying, I got this huge download of information. Then it works like that. So the point is, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's good to learn. It does great things for you, but it's not going to keep anyone back. If you have that longing in your heart to learn what's right and to treat others well, heaven is just going to fill you up. 
and you're going to have this amazing capacity to understand, to be articulate, to, to navigate life, and you're not going to be held back at all. So everybody has the potential to learn how to love and long for the truth, right? That everybody in any situation can be doing that, and that's how you really build your foundation for learning. Speaking of foundations, thinking about the what I would call the childhood innocence, spiritual brain region, that isn't that so important to life, that you have this childhood where everything is great, you know, and where people are nice, and you learn to love the world, and you sort of get this this connection to the, the greatest things in life. But that's not how childhood is for a lot of people. You can have horrific things happen to you in childhood, or you can just be neglected or just not get what you feel like you needed. Isn't that robbing you of something essential? You know, don't, don't you need that sort of angelic state of being a little kid? Well, Swedenborg says that everybody gets that angelic state. Even if the adults around you are not giving you angelic attention or, or treating you as you should be treated, you actually are hanging out at that very same time with real angels who do give those states to you. This is Spiritual Experiences 4382. He says, There was a little child of three years in a place of a certain land, and I spoke with angels about little children being ruled by good spirits and angels. Angels or angelic spirits spoke with me, and it was given me to know that they were from societies where there is a calm. For I felt a calmness of mind, and this for a half hour or an hour. They told, they told that they were with a little child, that this was their state of blessedness. I realized then, and spoke with the angels of the fact that with little children after birth, there are angels who are in a state of innocence, that there are those who are in a state of calm, and finally those who are in a state of caring for others. So with children, all children are these societies of angels, and they are present in a progression to give every little child the things that they need to move forward, and so that even if it seems horrific on the outside, or, or, or just like there's a loss of potential there, there is this deep connection with heaven, this intimate connection with heaven, where they're carefully being given the things that they need. So all of us, regardless of how the circumstances externally might not give us what, what we'd all hope a child would get, there is this angelic infusion initially. And this is why, Swedenborg says, in Matthew 18.10, it says uh, this about the angels with children. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father, who is in heaven. So it's even there, a warning, like, don't mess with childhood. You know, we, it is plugged in and it is connected. So everybody is given those angels regardless. So even if the situation in our lives and all these areas seem to be lacking or chaotic, there's a deeper related part of our spirit that's always protected. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful idea. And Swedenborg seems to say that that's the case. I've actually got another Divine Love and Wisdom quote that I think really fits with this. It's a bit uh, philosophical, but let's hear it. Perfection itself is in the Lord, and therefore in the Son, that is the first emanation of His Divine Love and Wisdom. It comes from there into things that are next in sequence, and so on in order, down to the lowest things, which are more imperfect as they are more remote. If it were not for this supreme perfection in things antecedent and constituent, neither we nor any living creature could arise from seed and then continue in existence. The seeds of trees and shrubs could not sprout and spread either. The more antecedent a thing is, or the more whole it is, the more immune it is from harm because of its greater perfection. Wow, it's beautiful. But what exactly does it mean? That is very cool. It's sort of like that idea in the New Testament that there are some places where thieves break through and steal, and then yeah. there are other places where you lay up your treasures in heaven because they can't get there from here right. kind of thing. There's a discrete, you know, separate degree of existence that that thing is on. It's always protected. It's sort of like this chain of existence coming out from God as, as perfection in the center into the deeper parts of us, and then finally out into this part here. But, uh -huh. but no matter what happens, on these outermost levels, you know, it's like if you're, you you drop your uh, your laptop and you know the the cover gets dinged up, the, the stuff inside the motherboard is still okay. Mm, that's right. That's right. In fact, even if you wanted to change what's in the chip, you, you couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's beyond you to change that. You could change maybe wiring or replace a battery or something yeah. like that, but but you can't get at that thing at the heart of it. It was also reminding me a little bit of. Um, 
don't know if you heard of curly in photography, where people are missing a part of their limb, and they take a picture of it with curly in photography, and the limb is still there. Like no, the, I have not heard like of that. Like the sort of electromagnetic energy of the limb is still there. Uh, but but the, but the, okay. but just the physical flesh so is you know essential. what I mean. So there's there's a part of it that you can't you you could cut off your like the physical flesh of your arm, yeah. but there's there's something there that's indestructible and and that's protected that's sort of inside. Right. I think about like the the black box in an airplane mm. that that's made so it doesn't matter. You can you can hit the water you know and, right. and explode or anything, but that that is protected. Could be it's beeping out. It does exposed to tremendous heat or under the yeah. water or whatever, and it, it just keeps going. There is a part of us that that protected mm. that the lord is looking after and it reminds mm. me of uh, uh the remnant oh the, oh yeah now describes. refresh my memory the remnant. Well, so secrets of heaven 561 says mm. it really well it says to explain what a remnant is it is not just the good and true things that we learn out of the lord's word from the time we are small and that become stamped on our memory it is also all the states that rise out of those things mm. such as a state of innocence from babyhood a state of love for our parents siblings teachers and friends a state of charity toward our neighbor and compassion toward the poverty stricken and needy in short it is all the states of goodness or truth. These states, along with the good and true things imprinted on our memory, are called a remnant. The Lord preserves them in us, hiding them away in our inner being. That really is like the same concept, isn't it? That it's that it's like in order to hide that, in order to preserve it, no matter what chaos we may go through yeah. later in our life, that's tucked away somewhere where it's not going to be harmed. That's that's yeah. very cool. Everything good. Every, uh, every time you've felt something loving, mm. you had a good experience, the good stuff you've learned is all there, and it's all somewhere beyond harm, which, yes. which I think is really... It's very merciful. Honey. Yeah. I mean, it's nice. You think, oh, there's no chance, but then like from that frozen soil, something can grow. That's still. right. So that's all well and good, but I feel like if we're going to ask this question, why doesn't life seem fair, there's still one big part of it that we haven't touched on. Oh, you're probably thinking of the moral side, right? Yes. That like the, um, why do some people uh, get thrown into a life that would make it seem harder to be good just from their external circumstances? Yeah. If, I mean, if the whole point of life is do good, don't do evil, right? As Swedenborg is telling us, but but it seems the, the places some people are born or, or the situations would just make it a lot harder to do the mm. things that we consider Good. I mean, do you think that you could take that on? I hope I can prove it in part three. So this is perhaps the biggest question of them all, not just sort of was your education shorter, circumstances or whatever, but but uh, what about the question of goodness? Is there a goodness region in our spirit and how is that affected by the things that we did? Uh, obviously, there's some connection, but isn't it true that some people are born into this world? You could be born into some criminal situation. You could be in some war-torn country, and you're eight years old, and someone hands you a gun and and says you got to kill people or something, you know. And isn't that going to have a difficult impact? Because that's not just something that, oh, you were deprived of, of something, but that these are things you actually committed yourself, you know, or if you were born in a situation where you're stealing, uh, you know, you're part of some little group that's on the street and you're stealing, and so you're introduced into that lying to people, you know, from an early age or whatever, doesn't that corrode you? Isn't that unfair that you would be stuck in that situation before you were old enough to have a choice? What about that? Well, a very intriguing answer to this comes from, of all places, an Old Testament law about an ox. This is Exodus 21, 28. If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. And from context there, it talks about the fact that this particular animal had never displayed this behavior before. All of a sudden, out of the blue, it just stabs somebody and and, and they die. Uh, then it's important to put that animal to death and not eat its flesh. What a weird little typical Old Testament little detail to throw in there. What does that mean? Uh, but that its owner will be acquitted, meaning the owner is not responsible. The owner is not to be held to be at fault because of that 
circumstance. So what does this have to do with what we're talking about here? We're not talking about animals, are we? Well, Swedenborg says that the Old Testament, uh, all of these kind of things in Scripture, are actually about one person. Like we have an ox. There's an owner in us, and there's an ox in us. Weirdly, it's almost similar to the idea that you can you have eyes that see, but your tongue can also see, like the ox is a separate part, but it all feeds into the same thing. Your ox is your outer self. So we all have heredity. Swedenborg says that we have hereditary evil. We just got it from our parents and our ancestors and whatever, and it's just in there. And we don't even know. And sometimes, I don't know if you found this, but you go through your life and all of a sudden, some issue gets triggered and you're doing something you didn't even expect to be doing. Your outer self is just doing something because you got triggered and there was a, a, a latent you know, tendency in yourself that you never even realized was there. And all of a sudden, this thing is coming out of your outer self. Well, what Swedenborg is saying is that the owner is our inner self. The owner is not responsible for that. If the ox never showed that behavior before, if your outer self never did that kind of thing before, you're not responsible for it. You still have to take responsibility and deal with that. And the interesting detail about not eating the flesh of that animal uh, spiritually means that we are not to identify with that. Don't think, oh, I am this kind of person. Look at what my outer self did. No, don't eat that. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. It's bad. Uh, don't make that, don't internalize that and decide that who you are because there is a goodness region within us that's not affected by that. We still have the ability to tell right from wrong and so on. doesn't matter what happened to us. If you're, you know, uh, eight years old and someone hands you a gun, well, those circumstances are taken into account in the spiritual perspective on us that the other world has. They can see all that. They know it's all part of our file. The Swedenborg even says that they can see that visually represented around us. So they can tell, oh, these were the circumstances in which these acts were committed. And this is absolutely crucial. Here's another quote from that translation, Love in Marriage. This is section 530. And it's been talking about bad things that we've done. Namely, those things are not viewed according to the things done as they appear outwardly before people. In fact, not as they appear before a judge, but as they appear inwardly before the Lord and by him before angels. That is, according to what kind of desire and understanding the person put into them. This is not information that's readily available from this external perspective, but from the spiritual world, this kind of thing can be seen. In the world... Swedenborg points out, there are different circumstances that soften and excuse crimes and also that make them more serious and more blameworthy. In other words, one thing would be, oh, well, you know, this and that had just happened or you were tired and you fell asleep or something, as opposed to, no, it was a really malicious act and you meditated it for 10 years before you did it. You know, those things affect, even in this world, those things affect the punishment for a crime. He goes on, and yet accusations after death are not made according to the outward circumstances of the act, but according to inner mental circumstances. So imputations after death. Now, wait a second. What are imputations? Well, that's from a Latin root. I won't, uh, you know, trigger Curtis's issues, but uh, imputations have to do with uh, what you are held accountable for. What is attributable to you? Is this really a trait in you? Or is this something that someone else imposed on you from the outside? Imputations after death are made in keeping with what each one's intention and understanding are like. For the acts, what a merciful statement, go to the grave with the body, but the mind rises again. It's a very merciful and beautiful teaching. Swedenborg also explains that things are viewed in the light of our inherited evil. This is part of what the, the ox is, you know, the ox just has a certain animal nature and all of a sudden doesn't, doesn't like the look of somebody and, and they get gored. Uh, that's taken into account. Was it the ox in us? Was it the owner? Did the owner know about this or not? All these circumstances are taken into account. We all have inherited evil. It comes rolling down through the generations, and some of that stuff is in there. You don't know what's in there. 
uh, but that is taken into account. That's all known. And in addition, if we are so unfortunate as to suffer from an impaired rationality, this is another circumstance that Swedenborg explains is totally taken into account. Now, what does impaired rationality mean? Well, it might just be a, a, someone who, you know, gets drunk or is, you know, taking medication or something like that. Uh, so it could be a momentary thing. It could be that the brain didn't develop, you know, deprived of oxygen at birth or whatever. And, uh, you know, all kinds of different things in between. It can even be a function of the sort of mindset, uh, the kind of concepts that have been drilled into us uh, through our lives and how we've been affected by that. All this is known and all this is taken into account. So it really is a merciful view. Well, it makes total sense. If God is actually divine love and divine wisdom, mm. divine wisdom would mean God would know the nuances of our life and, and what we're actually up against. And divine love would be wanting to, you know, not wanting to condemn or, or, or be harsh, but how can, can we help and be understanding? The more mm. loving and wise a person is, the more you know, okay, they're going to understand what's going on with me. So it's a, it's cool and that's concept. That's so true. That's yeah, so and true. I, I don't want to lose anything we've talked about this episode, so maybe we should do our, our wrap-up. Mm. Everything we learn about the physical world can teach us something about the spiritual world. And tonight we saw how research into neuroplasticity and the way that our brain interprets information shows us that there are deeper physical parts of us, specifically in the brain, that remain intact and ready to process information, even if the outer sense organs are damaged. In the same way, there is a spiritual part of us that is deeper still and safe from any harm that comes our way in the physical world. Even if it seems like we missed out on love or finding a relationship or if someone didn't have access to the necessary tools to learn and develop at an advanced level or if we didn't get love and nurturing we needed during childhood, our spirits remain intact, safe, and full of potential. And God always sees and knows us, not based on external actions, but on the thoughts, feelings, and desires inside us. Actions in this world are always seen in their context, and God knows intimately the struggles that each of us face. So those of us who are born or come into difficult circumstances won't be held to some arbitrary, unreachable moral standard, and those who weren't fully rational won't be held accountable for what they couldn't control. So... That's our show today. Do you have any uh, final thoughts on the whole mm. thing? It's, it just really strikes me how merciful it is, and it really does help to explain why you have, uh, like, why it's so great to have different levels. You need to be down in this world and yeah. having your life experience, and there's a lot of sorrow. Uh, you know, this is a veil of tears and all that kind of, yeah. you know, there's a lot of loss and pain that goes on and suffering in this world. Uh, but it's so cool to be reminded that there's a higher level where it, it kind of the analogy that strikes me right now is like it may be super, super cloudy or maybe dark. The sun is shining somewhere. You know, it really yeah. is behind the clouds somewhere. If you're going up in an airplane, you know, it's been overcast all day. But, oh, this it's, it's been up here the whole time. Yeah. I, one of the most comforting things that I, I see in this whole thing is that everybody has the potential to experience full, complete joy mm. like you can feel in this life like you're broken in a particular way or something is missing in you or you didn't that you could never be fully mm. whole but the idea that that in our spirit everything all that potential is still there that there's nobody no matter what you've been through no matter how you went through it who can't get to this complete state of of mm. heaven and happiness and peace and like everything is just fine you know so mm. that, that that's exciting to me um, yeah, yeah there's even some levels, uh, like Swedenbo talks about in, in Secrets of Heaven, the human internal, and at least some of the old translations okay. render it that way, which is some deep level within us that no matter what we've done, that remains pure. And it has to remain pure because that's where we receive that divine life that comes in that enables us to think and feel and, and you know, to yeah. act and speak and so on. Uh, that that thing is never stained by anything that we go through. It's, it's the same the day we're born and at the end of our lives in this world and so on. It's it's, it's always intact. Yeah, that's awesome. And I and I love the idea that the primary thing of importance in a lot of these scenarios is accessible to everyone. We talked about yes. education and right. that, that here it's like great education is only accessible to a few, yeah. but the ability to love, it, it like work in situations to just try to tend toward 
something good. Uh, everybody has access to that, and that's, that's right. the thing that that really matters. So it's it's like nobody is um, disadvantaged in a, in a way that's, that's right. unrecoverable. There's an essential fairness at way way behind everything. You can't see it on the outside at all. It's very baffling how unfair and unequal it is. But yeah. but at a deep level, it really is fair. Yeah, and that's the level that lasts and, and begins mm-hmm. our journey into. Mm-hmm. The forever life. So that's our show. Uh, we're going to get to a question of yours. But first, as always, I'll be right here giving some thank yous. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to help us out on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe. And also, when you subscribe, even if you already are subscribed, you really want to click the bell. If you click this little bell and select get notifications, that's by the subscribe button, then YouTube will actually tell you when a new video of ours comes out. So if you don't ever want to miss something amazing that we do, Subscribe and turn that notifications thing on. Also, if you want to support what we do at an even to an even greater extent and, and really be part of what makes this possible, hang out with us on Patreon, patreon.com slash off the left eye. It's where you can set up to donate a, just a dollar per episode. And then from that, not only do you get to know, hey, I make this possible, but also we give you some behind the scenes content as a thanks. This week, we have Chelsea from the writing team looking at the repentance episode, but going deeper and finding some really cool ways that that applies directly to our lives and that these concepts show up in our everyday thinking. So that's just a little thank you from us to you for doing that. Okay, this is a question we got on our show last week, Repentance, How to Be in Heaven Now. This question is from Megan. She says, here's my question. A person is surrounded by people who act like the monsters of greed and power mongering. Those are the monsters in in that episode. And although he, she doesn't do those particular things himself, has unsavory feelings in reaction to those things, given the example of Curtis hoarding the snacks... (laughs) Yeah. Can we all see that he shouldn't do that in the example, but what about the guy who just brought the snacks for everyone to share? How is he supposed to react to the hoarding and the denial? Mm -hmm. Even though he might have his own roots to dig out, we all have things for which we must repent. How do we respond to people who offend us with selfish and unkind behavior? Ideally, I know it should be with love, but how? That's a great question, Mm -hmm. because there's a hole there, isn't there? Because we're talking on this show a lot about Recognize, in last show in particular, recognize your own evils. Work on your own evils, that kind of thing. But there is this complicating factor, which is that you have to share the world with everyone else. And yeah. how do you react when they start to mess with you? The, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, it's not a satisfying answer, but... Uh, <laughs> that would fit with the show. Right? Yeah, right. Swedenborg talks about the fact that uh, uh, in ancient times... People had this whole kind of technology almost or something. It was like a, a whole paradigm, a whole methodology of how you treat other people and how you understand where they're coming from, what they need. And he says that this is what ends up in the Bible as saying that some people are, you know, the poor or in prison or, yeah. you know, the, the lame and, the, you know, the sick and the... Uh, right. all, all those kind of categories that it mentions. Not that you're sort of judging people harshly to say, oh, everybody's all, they're all blind and lame. And, yeah. No, it's about how how would you help someone who's thirsty, you would treat them differently than someone who is having trouble walking or something. Yeah. And so I, the reason I say it's not a very satisfying answer is that that doesn't tell you, we, like we've lost that technology. Yeah. You know, we don't know how to do that anymore. Um, Swedenborg says that this will be resurrected at some point. But, but to try to figure out, you know, so my best answer would be to try to figure out where you think the person is coming from. Are they, are they blind to their own behavior or is it sort of deliberate, you know? Yeah. And that whole quality that the New Testament talks about, about praying for others, mm-hmm. you know, to try to understand them, to forgive them, to excuse and overlook and, you know, that kind of stuff. A very, very difficult and challenging. Yeah. But the actual boots on the ground, like it makes a big difference whether you let something go or you call someone on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, yes. it, it changes the relationship. And so that's a very tough question, I think. Well, I th- but I like where you're going with that, that the, the antidote is knowledge of the person. Mm. Well, I think about, we do see this in certain areas, if somebody is addicted to a particular substance you what we've learned now is that when they're craving they can Mm. snap at you you know or they can talk differently to you and they can be a whole different person or we you know 
uh, or, or people or, with low blood sugar or whatever. Yeah, like, blood, right, right. I, I, I uh, knew somebody who was in the hospital and they started to get really cranky. I was told this uh, and just like really not complying and, and causing problems for everyone. And they had low iodine. So once they, wow. once the iodine got put back in, they were themselves again. Wow. So it just makes me think of part of part of the answer is that there's healing in the truth for you because we're talking about it's already life is hard enough with me trying to deal with my own stuff now i got to deal with these emotional yeah. wounds right. that, you know like like how is Stuart going to deal with in that episode the fact that i stole his snacks that hurts right. man it, it, it's not just something you can laugh off but i think it is knowledge is the key because i feel like the more that i understand why somebody is doing something the less threatening it right. feels for example like if if somebody you know on the street just said something mean to me, I would oh is this personal? Is it because of how I am? But if I knew about them, oh well they uh, since childhood have always had right. a problem with something, and they see me kind of as a, re- a representation of it makes it hurt less for me because I, yeah. I realize oh they're de- they're deluded in a certain way. So that that kind of lightens it, and also. Um, the more that you have a perspective, like I think the younger a person gets, the less I, less it hurts me when they oh, say something, oh, right? right? Like if a right. little kid is saying, you're dumb, well, I know I'm not. I know you're just a little kid. Not to be condescending, but the more we understand what people are wrapped up in, uh, right. that can help. And and uh, those, again, sort of New Testament, and they're also in lots of other religious traditions too, the, the idea of forgiveness, of not taking revenge, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if I put myself in Stuart's situation in the the stack snack stealing episode, it's really you know, brutal. It does he? Uh, it, ideally, if he's being angelic, he's thinking about how to benefit you. Like it's not good for you yeah. to continue in that behavior. Does he rebuke you? Does yeah. he, you know, bring it to your attention at some point when you're sort of in more reflective mood or something? But his. His basic attitude is pretty clear. It's like, it's not sort of like, oh, I'm going to get him. You know, yeah. next time he parks, in a, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, right. deflate his tires or something yeah. like that. And, and um, uh, but to me, it's like the highest, most challenging form of wisdom to know how to deal with other humans. You know what yeah. I mean? Like how, how to really treat them in a way that's beneficial to them. Because some people need, uh, you know, kind of a, a rap on the knuckles and, and, and others yeah. need a courage, in, encouragement and, yeah. we you can know, do, love. We can do a whole show about this. Um, Couldn't we? I, yeah. I'm realizing now as we're trying to talk through this. And uh, I, I think that there's two sort of two scenarios. Like there's the what do you actually do with the person and then there's the how do you react emotionally. And inside I feel like yourself. Inside what do you yourself. do with it? Yeah, Because I right. find that, that certain things, people can do things that are mean to me and I've got this whole like long drawn out inner agony based on it that's something i'd like to figure out how to deal with and then there's also the like well what do i do and what do i say yeah but it's almost like if you can get the inner thing worked out then the outer thing is less of a burden that's right the last thing i have to offer is swedenborg's idea that it's heaven and hell coming through us you know, yes, that, that's right. That in myself, I'm looking at my own thoughts and feelings and saying, well, that, I just getting better and better. Like, well, that's just hell. I don't even need to worry about that. Maybe you apply the same thing to other people to say like, uh-huh, okay, right. so hell's, hell's talking hell's, to me. Hell's- Flowing through them right there. For some reason, yeah. that makes it because I think the most painful. I thing already is, know hell hates me, so like that's not news. You know? They do. So, they do. Right, I can right. count on that. Right. The, yeah. The most painful thing is to be rejected by a peer, like a, hu- a fellow human being or something. But if right. it's just like. Oh, you're just hell. Hell's just doing its thing. Yeah, yeah hell right, is just right. hell. It talks to people all the time. To me, that softens it a little, but obviously it I don't have all... excuses the of... person for, yeah, yeah exactly. right, for being an inadvertent channel for that for a second or something. That's right. So, I mean, I feel like that's what I've got right now. Yeah. Good. That's good. Great question, good Megan. Good question. And, uh, yeah, keep asking it. Keep asking mm. it, and, and maybe someday we'll do a whole program on that, see if we can find out. All right. Thanks so much. That's our show for this week. Thank you so much for watching. We're going to be back next week with one of our fascinating 10 questions episodes. So we take 10 of your really excellent questions and we give them to a panel of great Swedenborgian thinkers and and do our best to just talk over the concepts you introduce and get a, get a good number of people thinking, talking about, you know, how can this stuff really make life better? So hope to see you then. And uh, again, Thank you so much for watching. Swedenborg and Life is Amy Aquarola, Morgan Beard, Curtis Childs, Karen Childs, Matthew Childs, Alexa Cole, John Connolly, Cara Dom, Chris Dunn, Stuart Farmer, Ben Keyes, Reed McArdle, Chelsea Odner, 
Jonathan Rose, Shiloh Silverman, and Shada Sullivan. 